It feels good to be back in the saddle again. I'm excited to be able to be preaching and talking about the resurrection of Jesus, which I thought was kind of fitting, um, you know, that uh, getting a second chance at life. And the great news is, is we all get a second chance at life. And um, so if you haven't been with us, we've been going through a chronological book of the Bible uh, that Bible stories all put together called The Story. And if you're visiting with us and you don't have a copy of that, we would love for you to have one. Um, there's some at the table in the back. And if you want to grab one right now or after service, we would love to have you get one of those and read through. It does a great job of kind of giving us the big picture of what's going on in the Bible. So it gives us this upper story of what's going on. Because lots of times as we're do it, dealing with life and looking at what things are going on, you know, it's the day in and the day out. And there seems to be things where you go, OK, God, why did this happen? You know, there's lots of things we could use as examples, right? You know, different difficulties and different things. But later on and sometimes not very later on, we get this upper story view of what God was trying to do and how he was moving those chess pieces. And it's just encouraging. But as we've gone through this, this book and we've seen so many different things. Oh, and here's one of the story Bibles that we would love for you to have. And translation, my wife wants me to sit down while I'm preaching. So just in case. And the Lord. I think I remember somewhere in, in Genesis where it said, and the Lord. I, I married over my head, and I'm really grateful for that. But, but here's what the story Bible looks like, and we would love for you guys to have one. There's some in the back. You can go grab one in there. But we've been going through this chronological, uh, kind of as it happens in time, and the big picture of these the different things going on, and we just see again and again this, this, this idea of God's relentless pursuit of us, where he just loves us, and no greater way do we see this than the empty tomb and the celebration of Jesus raising from the dead. It's just amazing. So if you read with us last week, it was really good. You know, you see this, this scene of his death and his physical death and taking on the sin of the world. And, and we, you know, we looked at that and all hope was lost. And the, the apostles were trying to figure out what's going on and what's God's big plan in this. And, and I'm sure you, you, uh, there was probably some words to describe what they were feeling but relieved and joyful were probably not those kind of words that they were thinking of. I think that's what the Jews were thinking. The people who had Jesus killed, they're, they're relieved and they're joyful. And finally, we're done with this troublemaker. And they were just so prideful. They couldn't reason that this could have been the Messiah. It just didn't make any sense to them. And, and they, they look and go, God would never allow his own son to be executed. And, and not, not even to be executed, but to be executed in a horrific way as he was, was just ludicrous to them. It didn't make any sense and it just seemed so senseless. And, and I think the apostles at the same time, they had heard all these prophecies and what was written yet. It wasn't a, it revealed to them until later. They had heard it, but they didn't get it. What's interesting is some of the Jews got it, right? Because they say, hey, this troublemaker, this deceiver said that after three days he was going to rise again. So let's make sure that he doesn't do it because this will be a d difficult thing. The religious leaders were nervous. In Matthew chapter 27, we're going to pick up there and look at, it, look at a few scriptures in this. See, the Roman, they had taken this, this, uh, this, uh, the tomb, they had sealed it up. And the Roman centurion's job in this was to make, make sure that whoever died on the cross was dead. Like, that was the goal. That was their job. They were professionals at this. And so they're, they're saying, hey, it's, you know, it's the time of the Passover here. We've got to prepare. Let's take them down for the cross. So they go through and they, they break the legs of some of the, the, the criminals there. But they don't do it with Jesus. They come to Jesus and he's dead. So it says that one of the centurions take a, took a spear and lanced his side. And blood and water flows, it tells us. And so they were, you know, doing this and they're, they're looking and going, this is what's, you know, it's going to happen. And they're trying to figure out what, what's happening there. But they're wanting to make sure Jesus is dead. The centurion does this. And, and it's just the, the, these awkward moments of trying to figure out what's going on. But ultimately what they know is that there's no more Jesus. Matthew 27 the, 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 uh, the priests and the Pharisees come and say, Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, this deceiver said, After three days I will rise again. Give the order to make for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he's been raised from the dead. The last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered, getting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. 
So ultimately they said, hey, put, put some wax on there, seal it up, make sure that everybody knows that I have sealed this and if you cross it, you're going to die. So they're, they're saying, you know, make sure that it's sealed, but make sure that nobody gets, the, gets in there, that everybody knows what, what, what we mean business here. Now, it's interesting because all the apostles are thinking it's, the, it's over. Jesus is gone and he didn't, he didn't fulfill what we thought he was going to do. But it's these non-believers who said, hey, wait, he said he was going to do this, even though he didn't exactly say he was going to do this. Like they got the, me- the message. They got what was going on. And so they were worried. They were mindful of him, his prediction of conquering death and overcoming this. And, but for the apostles, for the Christ followers, it wasn't even on their radar. Have you ever had a time like that in your life where there's just something going on and it's like not even on your radar that God might be trying to do something good? You're like, why would God do this? And why is this happening? And, and other people go, yeah, but maybe God... No, you're like, no, 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 no. Clearly not. He hates me. <laughs> it's so easy to feel that way. And that's exactly what the apostles are feeling. They're enemies. They get it. So, you know, the heat is on. The disciples melted just like we can. They were depressed. They were frightened. They were distraught. They were confused. They were grief-stricken. Max Lucado said they cowered uh, in Jerusalem's cupboards and corners for fear of the cross that bore their name. They're thinking, okay, they killed Jesus. They might be coming for us next. That's a natural response to all of this. And as we read the New Testament nowadays, it seems that the disciples, you know, should at least held out hope for the three days. I mean, they all run away. At the, as he gets arrested, you would have thought, no, 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 this is all part of the plan. They didn't get it. Just like we don't get it. He had talked about being killed and raised from the dead. But at times it was tough to tell if Jesus was speaking figuratively or if he was sp- speaking literally. And they just had a hard time getting it. I think just like we would have. And you get, you know, in their defense, it was a pretty abrupt popularity change. From Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest and palm branches. And it's, he's the coolest guy ever to let's kill him and kill all of his disciples. That's a big popularity change. And I'm sure that was difficult for them. And ultimately, a lot of people have tried to explain away the crucifixion and explain away the resurrection from the dead and all kinds of concocted ideas and all these different things. And one theory is the swoon theory. Have you heard this? That Jesus just swooned on the cross. That, that he didn't really die, that he was just kind of fainted. And several days later, the cool air of the tomb r- made him uh, come to a conscious state. And he pushed away the heavy stone. He kicked all of the guards' tails and went on his merry way. And the disciples protected him to help him heal. I go, mm, I don't know if that really w- would work very well. Uh, a biblical scholar called Vernon McGee and he, he writes this. He says he got a letter and he was sharing it in one of his books. He says, Mr. McGee, our preacher said on Sunday that, that, that Jesus just swooned on the cross, that he didn't really die, that the disciples helped him back to a healthy state. What do you think about that? He wrote this answer back. He said, dear sister, do me a favor. Beat your preacher with a heavy whip 39 times. <laughs> Nail him to a cross. Hang him in the sun for six hours, run a spear through his heart, place him in an airless tomb for three days and let me know what happens. You know, that would be, that's one option. I'm not advocating that. But, but Jesus actually made around 10 different appearances after he had risen from the dead, or risen from the dead. And those are just the one the Bible tells us about. So there could have been other ones. But he didn't hide out. It wasn't a handful of disciples and close friends who just saw him afterwards. It it was tons of people, countless numbers of people that he came to. In chapter 20 and verse 19, it says, On the evening of that first day of the week, Sunday, when the disciples were together, the doors locked for fear of the Jews. So it wasn't like they were doing great and having a great time here. They were afraid. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Why do you think he said that? Because they probably weren't feeling super peaceful. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And, and it's interesting. He shows them their side and the disciples are overjoyed. I guess, I mean, that must have been an incredible moment for them to go from living in fear to, it's Jesus. That's a good day. That must have been exciting and so cool. But Thomas, Thomas gets a bad rap sometimes because he wasn't there for it. All these guys were afraid and living in fear. They weren't expecting Jesus to come back, right? But Thomas is the one who gets the grief. He wasn't there. What changed the other guys? They saw it. 
And we look at Thomas and go, what a doubter. I go, he's just like us. Or at least he's just like me. And, and, and they go, look at what happened. And he's like, I missed it. I'm not going to believe unless I put my hand, you know, touch the marks in his hands and I put my hand in his side. I'm like, you wish you wouldn't have said that, I bet, later. And, and, and so Mary Magdalene is, you know, talking about this bizarre story and wishful thinking, how she saw Jesus and all these things. And now his buddies see Jesus except Thomas. And Thomas looks and goes, hey, unless I can do it, unless I can touch it, unless I can feel it, I won't believe. And maybe that's where you're at today. They go, I'll go to church, but I, unless I can, like, you know, wrap my head around this, I'm never going to believe that. Unless I can, like, touch it. I can't believe it. So you're in good company. The apostles who walked with Jesus and talked with Jesus and saw these miracles were fed by Jesus, saw him raise people from the dead, still didn't quite get it until they saw it. But the cool part is God wants to help us to see it. And I think, just like Thomas, we've got to be open to finding the answers to life's question. And one of the most important ones is, did Jesus come back from the dead? And I think if you keep on studying and keep on coming to church and getting into the Bible, you will see and come to the same conclusion that Thomas did. In John chapter 20 and verse 26, see, for Thomas, it changed his entire belief system here. It says a, a week later, he had to wait a whole week as everybody else is kind of getting it. Have you ever been that way where you're like, how come it's so easy for them? They understand it and they get it and they believe it. It's taken me longer. That's okay, too. After a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with him. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They still needed to hear it. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my, st- in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. It's a good response. When you finally see Jesus, that is the, no- the response. My Lord my God, it's, it's what, the commitment we make at baptism that Jesus is Lord. And that's what, what Thomas says. And then he goes on to say this. He says, the Jesus told him, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. And I want to share three quick points or three results that we get from the resurrection. Result number one is this. The resurrection vindicated Jesus. He was the fulfillment of what had been promised in Scripture. And, and it's so amazing. The resurrection of Jesus is this kind of autograph of his authenticity. There's so much evidence to validate the resurrection of Jesus. Lee Strobel, in his book, talks uh, The Case for Christ. It's a great book. If this is something you really struggle with, The Case for Christ is a great book. Lee Strobel was a journalist. He wrote this book. Um, kind of as an atheist, and as he was studying this out, became a Christian and, and just started to believe that Jesus really who was he said who he said he was. And he talks about Sir Lionel Luckhu, who was this attorney who had an, a 245 consecutive murder acquittals. He was in the Guinness Book of Record, World Records for the most being the most successful lawyer. So if you commit murder, this is kind of the guy you wanted to um, have on your side. So he was knighted by the queen twice. Uh, he was this justice, uh, former justice and a diplomat and, and all these different things. So he looked at the resurrection from his rigorous analysis of different things. And this is what he said. He says, I say unequivocally that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof, which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. You go, he looks at this and goes, Think about it. I see the evidence and it is holding true. Think about all the things we have, the staying power of this story. It has not stopped being told since it happened. It wasn't some flash in the pan. It wasn't some fad. Our entire calendar dating system is based upon it. The arrival, the life of Jesus. And think about all the changed lives as the testimony of this resurrection. And all the millions of people and so many of us, right, that became Christians because of looking at this. And you look at it and you go, yeah, but, but there, you know, there's, there's a lot of kooks out there who believe weird stuff, right? I mean, just watch late night TV and all these different things of, you know, things that go on or, you know, the Inquirer, you know, the, those magazines that just at the newsstand where you go, are, do people really believe this? And some people do. I'll give you that. But, you, you, you know, you take it a layer deeper. How about the response of Christ's enemies, to his resurrection, both before his resurrection and after. 
The fear that they had explains why they tried to make sure that he you know, couldn't be resurrected or fake the resurrection. That, that they, they, they were sure the disciples stole his body. They promoted that story to save face. They couldn't explain why the earthquake occurred, though. Like, okay, that one's a little tougher. They, they couldn't explain the fright of the soldiers that were there who said they, they fell over as though they were dead. The fact that they didn't kill the guards that were there must have meant they must have believed their story because otherwise they would have just killed them. And it was, it was credible witnesses of going on this. But I think the thing that helps me the most is this, the power of the prophecies that we have in the Old Testament. That's the coolest part because it's such a strong proof of all of this. The fact that, that the resurrection was prophesied and all the details about the life of Jesus were predicted in the Old Testament 100 years before he came is irrefutable. It's so cool to be able to see this. Second Peter verse 1 says this. says, We do not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Then you look at verse 21. He says, For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. In other words, the prophecies, they're not man's ideas. It wouldn't work if we, if we came up with this stuff on our own. <clears throat> but skeptics of Christianity used to explain away the v- validity of the crucifixion by saying, you know what? It never happened. All the transcripts we have are after Jesus was risen from the dead. So of course they match up. Of course that's what it is. So for centuries, those who doubted Jesus as the Messiah could si- simply excuse away some of these prophecies. And they say, well, duh, he, he just, we made it up. We made it look this way and, and made, made, made it just seem like he had fulfilled these when he hadn't really. And they just were written after Jesus had, had died, after he lived. So it's easy to fulfill a, script, a prophecy if you're the one making it up after you already know the story that happened, right? And so you go, see, it's all these things. Because a lot of the oldest manuscripts we had were from centuries after Jesus. So that was a big one for a lot of doubters. A lot of doubters. But something happened in 1947 that took that argument away. And it's continued to happen since then. There's an area called Qumran, and it's uh, near the Dead Sea. And here's a little picture of, uh, of where that is. So if you don't not great at geography, you can, you can see where these caves are of what we're talking about. And there was a shepherd boy who was roaming around in this desolate area. And there's no vegetation. And he had some things. And, and he was doing what all good boys do when there's rocks around. We throw them. And uh, so he's tossing these rocks and he throws them up into these little holes in the caves and he throws this rock in there and all of a sudden when he throws his rock in one of those holes, he hears, and he hears some pottery break. So he's intrigued and as all good boys do, they go into a cave when there's no lights and nothing going on and something strange in there. And so they go in, he goes in and he finds these, these scriptures um, encased in these, in these uh, clay jars. That was a tough word to find in my head there for a second. Um, and they find these scrolls all wrapped up and, and they carefully enroll and they start studying these things out. You know what's amazing? All the predictions and all the prophecies that we had for the, from the later manuscripts, guess what? They were in these. They were there. It talks about how Jesus would be born. It talked that he'd be born of a virgin. That he'd be born in Bethlehem. That he'd be betrayed by his friends for 30 pieces of silver that he would be silent at his trial, trial, that he'd be executed among thieves, that his enemies would cast lots for his clothing, that the tomb where he'd be laid would be a brand new tomb, that he would raise from the dead. They're right there in these scrolls that were written hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus. The Dead Sea Scrolls stand as this undeniable testimony to the credibility that we have that comes from these prophecies that aren't just made up stories by men. How could that happen hundreds of years before because it's God. And, and it's such a, a great thing. And, and then you go, the eyewitness accounts, not just of those who were close to Jesus, but the dozens who weren't close to Jesus, who were enemies of Jesus even. Talk about him and talk about these prophecies and all the things that were going on. And Jesus did his final miracle and miraculously ascended into heaven. Bunches of people saw this. And, and you know, as the disciples... I bet the disciples, you know, they, they, they may go, well, they just got together and concocted this story. Like they all just agreed that this is what happened and that's how it did. And, you know, but they really, I bet they weren't really there. They all just, you know, put their hands together and said, okay, on three, one, two, three, story. You know, and that's what they were going to do. And that's what they were going to stick with. And they just made it up. Well, the strongest proof for that 
against that for me is the fact that those, all but one of the apostles were martyred. John was the only one who wasn't martyred, and church tradition says that he was try, they tried to boil him in oil, and they couldn't kill him that way, and so they exiled him to the island of Patmos, and that he died of old age there. But every other one of the disciples, apostles, excuse me, apostles, was, was, was died a martyr's death, dragged by a horse, beheaded, crucified upside down. You go, if they had made it up, and there was no motivation right there at the end, to go, okay, you just killed all of my family and you're going to kill me if I don't recant this story. I think I'd change my tune pretty quick. But that they didn't. I just go, this wasn't a blind allegiance, misguided trust. They go, it is true. It's true. And they lived it out. And, you know, how much did they believe? Man, they believed it so much that they said, I will never do this. I won't recant my faith. Because why? Because Jesus has overcome the grave. So anything you do to me doesn't make any difference because I'm living for eternity. I'm not living for today. And that's the greatest part in all of that. And so it's amazing to see all of that happen. Peter says, hey, I'm not even worthy to be crucified like Jesus. So he requests to be crucified upside down is what church tradition says. And and you go, it's amazing just seeing what they were willing to do. In Acts chapter 1, in verse 3, It says of Jesus this, it says, After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So here's the second result of the resurrection. The resurrection defeated death. Resurrection defeated death. The enemies of of Christ did not try to claim that there was not an empty tomb. Isn't that interesting? They didn't try to fight that one. They go, okay, we know it's empty, but here's why. It must have been faked. They, the disciples stole the body. And they were sure that that was what, what had happened. And they just go, no, they must have stole it. And you go, it, why would they have done that? Why did they do the, those things? I go, well, the eternal perspective is you know, trying to fulfill that story. But if they were martyred for that, I doubt that they would have stayed with that story. But the eternal perspective of this, Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though they are dead, yet they shall live. You know, it's interesting. So you go, what problems do I have right now? Well, Jesus can overcome those. What problems will you have in the future? Well, Jesus will overcome those too. Why? Because he's overcome the grave. He's overcome everything. I think the cross of Christ shows us his love. The empty tomb shows us his power. And I just go, it it, it does. It it shows us so much there of who Jesus is and and what he tried to do. And he defeated death in that. And the third and final point in this, the resurrection restored hope. And to me, this is the ultimate in this whole thing. Because death is the ultimate slap in the face. It'll catch every one of us. Now, no matter how old you are, no matter what goes on, nobody outlives it, nobody outruns it, nobody outsmarts it. We all die. Even Jesus died. So we better find an answer for death. I feel like I've got a little different perspective on this than I did a few, a few months ago. You know, because I go, 41 years old, why in the world? And you know, it's interesting. My daughter, uh, the Thursday before I had the heart attack, that Thursday night, she had this dream that I died. And she's like, it was super vivid, Dad. And, you know, and she's kind of emotional about it. So you kind of listen to that when you're, as a dad and your daughter, sharing a story like that. And, and so it was funny, that next day I was talking to somebody, and if it was you, please tell me, because I can't remember who it was. But talking about, like, death, and I go, I wonder how I'm going to feel knowing I'm going to die, if I know when I'm going to die. And so I've thought about that a lot more recently. You know, and so honestly, you know, Saturday as I'm having the heart attack and the doctor starts panicking and the nurse is like harpooning my arteries with the IV thing because she can't make it work right. I had this moment where I go, I think I'm going to die. And I was, I was, I'm like, okay, I was just thinking about what am I going to feel like this yesterday and it's happening today. And I'm not going to tell you what I thought yet, because I'm going to save it, because it's really good. (laughs) And honestly, I don't feel like crying right now. 
Because I want to wrap up and I want to focus on the first person who saw the resurrected Lord. Mary. Mary Magdalene. And I don't know how much you know about her, but I thought today it might be cool to just look at this really briefly. Because she's the first eyewitness. And what's really interesting is the first eyewitness was a woman. And you go, what's the big deal about that? Well, in Jewish culture, a woman couldn't even testify in court. So people who want to say that, you know, Christianity and the Bible is like against women, they don't know what in the world they're talking about. God is for women, protecting them and honoring them. You look at the scriptures about that. But who does he, ha- who does he appear to first? A woman. You go, if you really wanted to prove it, you should have appeared to somebody who's like really respected. See, God doesn't care about that. He appeared to somebody who really believed. Because if he was trying to fabricate it, they would have had a better story than her. They would have picked somebody better. In verse 11 of chapter 20, it says, Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? I love that line, by the way. Like, I don't know why, just a woman. Uh, they, they have taken my, oh, my Lord away, she said. I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. See, Mary buried more than than just a friend. She buried the only person that she felt like had helped her. Mark's gospel gives us some insight into her resume of who she was. And who she was was something you would conceal more than, you know, reveal to other people. You know, that that it says that she was healed of these seven demons. Can you imagine the life that this woman lived, afflicted like that, and the, the demon possession, and, you know, that all these things going on, that she was... Co- Afflicted by all these things and the presence and manifested in her and the emotional ravaging that must have gone on in her head and in her heart. Man, just what that must have been like. And but Jesus comes along and instead of shunning her, loves her. He completes her and transforms her and heals her. Gave to her when nobody else would even give her the time of day. Jesus changed her. And Jesus wants to change all of us. And I want you to notice something. She stayed stayed devoted even after he died. And the angels come and they said, why have you taken my Lord away? Thousands called him Lord when he entered Jerusalem. But she was the only one that was there. She was the only one that washed his feet. But everyone thought he was dead and buried and only one person thought to call him Lord. And that was Mary Magdalene. She was devoted and her love got her to that tomb on Sunday morning so she could put some spices on the body and still honor him and take care of him. And so she makes this journey while everybody else is sleeping. Her love had had just done this. And and she's thinking, you know, he's the gardener. Says, sir, if you carry him, tell me where you put him. I'll carry him. How in the world is she going to carry him? But she's so committed and so concerned. There's no way that she could have done that. And I wonder if Jesus disguised his voice or if she just didn't notice. But it's interesting. Why are you crying? She doesn't recognize that. But when you say a person's name, says Mary, and instantly she knew it was him. Jesus said the sheep recognize the voice of their shepherd. I want you guys to know today that the shepherd recognizes your voice. And if we're following him, we're supposed to recognize his voice. And he invites us and says, hey, come and know who I am, the resurrected Lord. You know, that ultimately that's what God wants us to do. In Romans chapter 8, it says, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give you life to your mortal bodies in the same Spirit living within you. Romans chapter 6 talks about that as well, that we, in baptism we participate in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. You know, lots of times we can focus on the cross and focus on his death and how horrible we are and our sin that put us in there. But I love how Don led our hearts to say, man, it, 
It's that, it's that righteousness that comes only from God. That God wants us to live resurrected lives. That God's called us not to, to live in the tomb and live in death, but to say, you got a second chance. You can do this different. And you go, no, I can't. And God goes, you're right, you can't. But through the power of Jesus, through the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead, each of us can live a new life and live a complete life that God has called each and every one of us to. And that's our challenge. We've all got a second chance. I get to feel it a little bit more all the way around, I guess. I, I don't even know how to describe that, but each one of us, you go, but, 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 but. I go, what bigger but in there could be of three days in the tomb? Jesus had a pretty good excuse of, I'm too far gone. There can't be anything. But there's irrevocable proof. And the coolest part is each one of us has something in our life that God has changed us. That we have a testimony. You have a story to prove that not only was Jesus raised from the dead, but he's given you a second chance and raised you from the dead. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I know that, uh, that all of us have been the doubting Thomases. That all of us have been those ones to look and say, what's the hope and what's the plan? And God, we just want to touch it and we want to feel it. And help us not to, to be stuck. Help us to believe who have not seen. And God, that, that's all of us. We weren't there. But we read the, the, the story. We read the scriptures. And God, when we apply them to our life, we are changed. Help us not to, to run back to the tomb and live there, but help us to live resurrected lives that can be changed by your power. Lord, we love you. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.